The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. This is Leon Chani for Leon Chani Report. We're sitting in Afekat, the home of Motagur, the former chief of the Israeli Defense Forces, a great paratrooper, one of the, uh, I think, capturers of Jerusalem in the 67 war, chief of staff during the tenure of uh, Asa Weitzman and uh, Camp David, and now a member of Knesset with the Likud faction, believed to be one of the best military strategists in Israel today. But uh, militarily, was it the right move to restrain the government? Yes, I believe so. At least that was what I recommended to the government. Although I am in the Labour Party, not the Likud Party. But uh, I thought that that should be the policy of the government because we had to prove that this was not our war at all. We should uh, make the maximum to stay out of it. And as a matter of fact, the first week of our restraint brought a lot of uh, advantages to Israel, both on the political side and security. So for about 10 days, it was okay. But uh, the Israelis are known to have terrific intelligence. Did the uh, army expect that Saddam Hussein was this strong? Yeah, we knew uh, quite well that he was uh, not only relatively strong, but uh, objectively, when I say strong, with a big military uh, power. Right. Uh, that does not mean that it's a very uh, effective power. So we knew, especially when we followed him during the war with Iran, he built more and more divisions and he got more and more weapons of all kinds. The fact that we bombed his uh, nuclear reactor in 1981 proved that we were very much concerned about what he might do. Yes, we were ready for that, but... Uh, Did you agree with that bombing in uh, 81? I know that uh, Shimon Peres opposed it. Uh, at that no, time, we, he was the leader of the Labor Party. Uh, what we opposed, most of us, what we the opposed... Timing? Yeah, we, we were not sure that uh, the government has really done the maximum in order to prevent that by uh, political moves. Uh, we thought that any... Uh, military action connected with nuclear power is uh, relatively dangerous. And we wouldn't like to be the first one to do something of that kind. But uh, in retrospect, we know that first of all, political efforts were done and unfortunately were not effective. So I believe the government decision was very right and very good. And anyhow, it proved that we were very concerned with the Iraqi uh, armed forces. We believed when I was still chief of staff that they might send a body of about five to seven divisions to future fights in Israel to combine forces with the Syrians and Jordanians. And we have built very specific means in order to face them. So I believe, yes, we knew that the Iraqis are powerful. I think that what surprised most of us was that after the eight years of war with Iran, he would dare to contradict the whole world and do something like that in Kuwait. And up to the last moment, where he still had the chance to move back to uh, face a war of that kind. And I believe he made a big mistake. The United States um, counts sorties. Every time an airplane goes up, they consider it a sortie. In the Israeli Defense Forces, I believe you count hits. Am I correct or incorrect? Well, it's in between. You know, Air Force people all over the world count sorties. And when they see the bomb explodes, they believe that they've done it. And I remember these uh, discussions when we were still young paratroopers and they were young Air Force people. The discussion still goes on. And uh, that's uh, why the 
general philosophy of the Israeli armed forces is that for our conditions, I'm not speaking about the United States, but for our conditions, especially when we have a very short political time in every war, because as you know, whenever we start succeeding, somebody will stop us. So we have to achieve a decisive victory very fast. That can be achieved only by the combination of air activity and ground activity. But the United States is a big power. They think, and maybe they're right, that they have all the time in the world, and they can hit and hit again and again and again with the Air Force. Uh, there are people in the world who think that Israel has this magnificent, invincible army, and that had Israel been attacked by Iraq and not Iraq gone into Kuwait, which brought America into the war, uh, Israel might have been able to take care of Iraq more rapidly than the United States. Do you think that's a fallacious argument? No, I believe it's true. First of all, I don't think that we would have gone to fight in Iraq. I mean, we are not built for that. We no, no, are, if Iraq yeah, attacked you. We are built to defend that country. And assume, uh, assuming that uh, they would have sent uh, a substantial military power against us, no doubt that our strategy would have been entirely different to smash them as fast as possible. And in the days before the war started in Kuwait, it was my proposal and I made it known and I uh, still think that uh, in a certain way Americans will be able to prove that, that the big Iraqi force in Kuwait is a big bluff. I mean, they have a lot of forces, they have a lot of infantry and a lot of tanks and so on. That does not mean, as I mentioned before, that these forces are very effective. And I believe that uh, once a very powerful, highly motivated uh, ground force will attack them and uh, destabilize them, then the American Air Force will be able to smash them, really, as we did in uh, 56, in 1967, and in the second part of 1973 which proves that this is a, a working strategy. At least I'm talking about the Middle East. And no doubt that if we had to do the job against Iraqi forces, we would have done it in an entirely different strategy. An airstrike, but an immediate attack on the ground in order to smash them, to, as I said, destabilize them and force them to move. Once they move, the Air Force is very capable. The American pundits had predicted, Henry Kissinger, I was on a television show with him, he predicted the war in the Middle East would last 14 days. It's now into the 18th day, but so obviously he's not a prophet or he's not Henry VIII or the IX. Uh, your prediction, how long can this war last? Well, that depends mainly on the appreciation of the political development, mainly among the Arabs. Until now, there is no proof, and I saw yesterday the president on the TV, and in that respect, he is right, that there is no sign of any break in the Arab countries that are members of the coalition. There are demonstrations in uh, faraway countries, like Morocco and others. Uh, this is the main, I believe, uh, constraint on the president, to what extent the Arabs will continue uh, to fight with him. As long as he believes that that coalition can uh, hold, I believe that they will continue with the air bombardment. They find it uh, working, they find it uh, successful. And if they believe that it uh, might save casualties, I think it's a good strategy. By the way, n it's not only a lesson from Vietnam, uh, the wish to save casualties. I mean, whenever you fight a war which is not a war of survival, you have to be very careful in that. And when we had to fight terrorists, for example, uh, this was one of the major calculations always, because whenever you have to compare strategies, saving lives is becoming a major element in your calculation. So I believe that as an American, as a human being, as a president, his calculation is very correct. So he will have to examine almost daily the reaction of the Arab world and uh, the uh, uh, success of the air bombardment. If he can combine these two elements for a quite a long time, I believe they will continue bombardment and maybe they are doing the right thing. The Scud attacks on Israel, are they having any real effect on the population? Psychologically? Until now, no real effect. Psychologically, very much. 
first of all, the damage has been done. And you know, it just comes out of the black skies. Nobody knows. And people are concerned. But I would say that mainly people are concerned because of the perspective of chemical war. This has become something very terrifying. Mainly because, first of all, people don't know what it really is. Nobody knows. And you know when you don't know, you're afraid. So, no doubt the SCAD have, uh, the SCADs have uh, initiated in Israel a certain new kind of fear and concern which was never before. And uh, only when the war will be over, maybe we'll be able to analyze what effect it will have on our future strategy and national stability. Uh, I believe that uh, the effect will not be very substantial, but there will be certain effect. I can judge it from the people I know from very close. And the effect that it has on the political decisions. So uh, it is a new dimension and a very negative one, no doubt about it. We'll hold for a commercial break. We'll be back in one minute speaking with Motagur, the former chief of the Israeli Defense Forces, a great uh, commander for the paratroopers and now a member of the uh, Labor Party. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Leon Charney's new book, The Battle of the Talmuds, is now available as an audiobook. This wonderful CD can be ordered directly from the publisher for just $29.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Listen as this audiobook explains how Judaism's greatest scholars broke from their own history and gave spirituality to a people without a homeland. And you can also get the audiobook version of Leon Charney's bestseller, The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get a detailed explanation of one of the oldest and most revered prayers in the Jewish religion as Charney's book explains how the Kaddish evolved. Both audiobooks are available directly from the publisher for $29.95 each, plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call 201-944-7600 and order with your credit card. That's 201-944-7600. Immerse yourself in Jewish history. We're back with Matagor former chief of the Israeli Defense Forces and now a member of the Labor Party. We visited uh, with Mayor Dinkins the other day a Patriot site and we saw uh, 350 of our soldiers or 250 of our soldiers. How does it feel to have American soldiers uh, uh, on Israeli soil in a sense defending Israel? To see American soldiers here it's not so bad. We have seen a lot of British, Australians during the years. But the fact that they have to participate in our defense, this is something we don't like very much. It was always against our basic uh, doctrine. And I hope that it will be very soon over and our troops will be able to replace them. Uh, still, I believe that uh, because of that, uh, the sudden changes in that war and some of the surprises by Saddam Hussein's behavior, Nobody takes it seriously as a real participation of America in the defense of Israel. Everybody understands that uh, it became part of a very urgent necessity, but not a strategy. So uh, talking to Israelis, they don't feel that uh, suddenly we became dependent on the United States. Uh, the reactions from the Arab world are not such that they think that we became dependent on that. But I think that the major importance of the question you have presented is if we come back to the policy of restraint, 
at a certain moment it was my feeling that as a result of uh, many elements together, the fact that we did not react, and the Arabs are used that we do, and the fact that uh, some uh, experts, so-called, all over the world started to analyze whether we can do something or we cannot. The fact that there was a question whether can we do better than the Americans. That was, that had a very bad uh, effect. That's why I thought that after the seventh, I think it was the seventh missile attack on Israel, I thought that we should initiate uh, our uh, activity and we should try to preempt and strike the missile sites before they shoot, mainly before they start to shooting if they have chemical warheads. Because, you know, when we are talking about the deterrence, the importance of the Israeli Defense Forces, you never know when you lose it and how much you are going to pay for it. So this is something that you have to make sure that exists all the time on a permanent basis. And uh, still I believe that we have the right and the government has to, uh, to choose the right moment cause the right strategy to hit the Iraqis directly by Israelis. But uh, the war ends. Palestinian issue still remains. How do you solve it? Well, that's a very good question. But did I cut those bad questions? <laughs> but no, it's a very good question because this is a question that nobody has an answer. I mean, we know that we have to solve this uh, problem. We have, uh, we know that we have, both people, we have to establish a basis for coexistence. I was born in Jerusalem, and I know that problem since my uh, birth, many, many years ago. And uh, that's why I say that it's very difficult to find a solution, because somehow, every certain years, uh, war, comes up and prevent a logic solution to the problem. And there is a difference in approach by the two cultures. We came, most of us, from a world, from a civilization of logic. Uh, most of the Arab countries base their attitudes on emotion. And uh, always when something, a certain deep question comes up, we will try to solve it in a logic way. They become very emotional, like now. All the Palestinians supported Saddam Hussein. Not because Saddam Hussein did anything for the Palestinians. Just they were really hoping that a certain Muslim Mashiach is coming. He will solve everything. Messiah for the non-Jews who are listening. Uh, he will solve everything. And Israel will just disappear. That's the basic hope they have. Now imagine we Israelis, when we see them expressing themselves in that way, we say, what the hell? How can you negotiate? How can you make any deal with the people? That basically and openly, explicitly, wish your disappearance. This is a continuous process. And that's why it's so difficult to solve. Because it's easy for me to say, no more PLO, no more these leaders, that supported Saddam Hussein. So, who will be the representative of these Palestinians? This is their problem, to choose once and for all leadership that will be able to negotiate openly and willingly, understanding that there should be a compromise and concessions on both sides, a certain mutual approach, but honest, if I tell you that uh, right now I see how this is going to happen, I will lie to you. I know that the PLO is over. Their support to Saddam Hussein was just impossible for us. Whether they will have, that they will be able to choose new leadership, I hope so. Because otherwise it will be an ongoing problem and we have suffered a lot, both sides, from that. But it's a... Uh, well, we know one thing for sure. The funding that they got out of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and the, uh, the Emirate States will stop. That is absolutely... That's for the PLO. Yes. That's why I differentiate between the PLO is over. 
But I was uh, growing up in Jerusalem in a quarter Mekor Baruch with Arabs. So it doesn't really depend on the leadership. It depends on the fact that we live together and we have to find a way to coexist. So leadership comes and leadership goes. Unfortunately, until now, most of their leaders became very extreme in time of crisis. And then emotionally, it's impossible for both sides to sit together and negotiate. Uh, so uh, we'll have to wait some time after the dust will come down when the war is over to see to what extent the Palestinians, mostly those who live with us here uh, in the Judea, Samaria and Gaza, to what extent they really can finally create a sentiment, uh, a basis for mutual understanding and coexistence. I believe, knowing most of the Israelis, that once we shall feel that this is possible, it's an ongoing process among the Arabs, uh, the approach in Israel will be very positive because people are really tired of that conflict and would like very much and they understand logically that it has to be established on a basis of compromise and concession. But they want to be sure that uh, we'll be safe here. That's a very complicated issue. Yesterday I attended the uh, Knesset session <clears throat> and I spent a lot of time in Le Miznon, which is your restaurant. It's uh, what I call the lanes of New York. Uh, that's where all the scuttlebutt happens and everybody um, talks and you, you hear a lot. Uh, one of your ex-generals, uh, Mr. Gandhi, uh, who uh, headed the Maledit Party, or heads the Maledit Party, which, uh, whose party stands for the, I guess, the eviction of all Arabs from the state of transfer, Israel, yeah. transfer, uh, was voted into the government as a minister without portfolio. What's your reaction? Big mistake. First of all, of course, I don't like the idea of this uh, transfer. Not that it didn't happen in the world. Only the last few years, a lot of Bulgarians, for example, were chased from Bulgaria to go to other places. Nobody moved. And I believe this is the last example that it happens in the world. But it cannot happen here. Uh, when we are talking about a Jewish state, when we are talking about a Jewish state that will be based on Jewish tradition, uh, approach, attitude to human beings and so on, it's just impossible for us to accept such a policy. So this is a basic uh, approach to that movement and to the people who represent it. Uh, so this is a big mistake, but I believe that uh, the Prime Minister made a big political mistake right now, because as a result of our policy in this war, we have gained a lot, both in Europe and the United States. Public relations. Public yes. relations, yes, and uh, I call it political gain. I believe, for example, that uh, no president in the United States, uh, knowing that the PLO supported Saddam Hussein, will try and force us anymore to talk to the PLO. Uh, by the way, the French admit that openly right now. So I'm talking about real political gains for the future. So how come that exactly at this point he has to introduce a movement like that to the government that will have very negative reactions all over and unfortunately justified reactions. So he made a basic mistake, a moral mistake and a political mistake and we'll just have to minimize that, uh, that the damage. A senior Likud official told me yesterday that all the gains that were made by the policy of restraint and the, all the goodwill that was established and the political gains that were established could go down 180 degrees from where they were because of this. Yet we know that uh, Prime Minister Shamir is a very clever man and there must be something underneath this all for the timing. The timing was incredibly either very clever politically internally are very foolish politically externally but does anybody understand why he did it is there any con opinion as to why he did it politically now you know I've done many uh, uh, military and political assessments in my life and sometimes uh, you are looking too I mean everybody is looking too deep into the problem 
And the answer is very superficial. clear and superficial. And if you ask me, I believe it was just a big mistake in judgment. I believe that, as we know, Shamir, Shamir is very good in, uh, in patience and, and waiting and not doing nothing. Uh, it so happened that the policy of restraint uh, fit him very well. You wait and see. He has this problem of domestic politics. And one of his ministers proposes to do that right now because domestically it might help him. And Shamir, like in many other cases in the past, he said, OK, let's do it, without really understanding all the implications of what he did. If you ask me, this is a simple answer to that very stupid decision because otherwise it wouldn't be so difficult to tell the religious parties in Melia Gudat Israel, listen, wait two weeks, wait three weeks until uh, the, the whole uh, war is over. And then we can do it easily. What, uh, what will happen? So in my view, it's only misjudgment and misunderstanding of all the implications. I just hope that it will be understood that way and not uh, giving any uh, political implication to the influence that Gandhi, that that movement of transfer will have on the government. Uh, but uh, it was a mistake. Right, we'll be back after a commercial break to continue our conversation with Matagura, member of the Labor Party, former chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, who will tell us his view of the future of Israel. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accords. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Named by the Foreign Policy Association as one of the top five documentaries of 2011, DVD now available on Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Leon Charney's new book, The Battle of the Talmuds, is now available as an audiobook. This wonderful CD can be ordered directly from the publisher for just $29.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Listen as this audiobook explains how Judaism's greatest scholars broke from their own history and gave spirituality to a people without a homeland. And you can also get the audiobook version of Leon Charney's bestseller, The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get a detailed explanation of one of the oldest and most revered prayers in the Jewish religion as Charney's book explains how the Kaddish evolved. Both audiobooks are available directly from the publisher for $29.95 each, plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call 201-944-7600 and order with your credit card. That's 201-944-7600. Immerse yourself in Jewish history. This is Leon Chani. I'm back with Motagur, the former chief of the Israeli Defense Forces, now a member of the Labor Party, and a, I think one of the best military strategists in the state of Israel today. But the, the future of Israel, I came in before with my crew, we saw your grandchildren here, and everybody looks exuberant and happy, and uh, 15, 20 years from now, they might be people who don't live in this country. How would you feel about that? Oh, very bad. If that will be the situation, it will be very bad. I hope this will not be the case. Until now, I have to thank God and ourselves, my wife and myself, that all the four kids not only live around us, very close, but willing to live here and working very hard here. Uh, so, uh, basically, I believe that there is a very good chance that they will uh, stay. Uh, you know, we are now in a time of war, but the real very important issue that we face today is the immigration from the Soviet Union, hoping that it will continue. 
this is the major issue. As long as people who live here realize that we have uh, also a mission to accomplish as Jews, as Zionists, uh, I don't believe that at least in my family uh, we'll have problems of that kind. And knowing most of the Israelis, I believe that this will become the major effect, effect in their behavior. And concerning the war, I'll have to tell you that after all, uh, the Iraqi forces are being destroyed and smashed and we are not fighting. And for people who have fought so much, this is a very big advantage. So we are concerned, as you see, the grandchildren are here because we are going all together when there is an alarm. But uh, after all, nobody of ours is fighting. So I believe that uh, if we put everything together and if the Americans will really become victorious in that war, the fact that Jews are still coming, pouring in huge numbers, and we have to absorb them and we have to think about how to deal with them and to deal with the other present problems, no, I believe that Israel with six million Jews will be a much better place to live in. Geopolitically speaking, and let's look at the world map, which I'm sure you do all the time. Uh, did you think a year ago Russia would be uh, where it is? Uh, I should not say Russia, the Soviet Union. There's a big difference between Russia and the Soviet Union. Very few people understand that. Boris Yeltsin is running Russia. And Gorbachev hopefully is running the Soviet Union. But it's changed. The, uh, concept of East versus West. Uh, we have uh, Lech Walesa now as the president of uh, Poland, which a year ago none of us believed. Czechoslovakia is free. Uh, Yugoslavia is free. What's going on, Mutt, in your opinion? First of all, it's a fact, I believe, that uh, most people did not, maybe even could not, foresee such a development. The problem with countries like uh, dictatorships, and the Soviet Union is a dictatorship, and was a dictatorship, you deal with one man, and it's very difficult to follow what he really is going to do, mainly when I'm not so sure that he knew right from the beginning what might be the outcome of what he started to do. But uh, no doubt there is a basic change. Uh, I, uh, you can feel that I am not very uh, open in my expression because I don't know yet, I don't think anybody knows what we have still in the future of the Soviet Union, of Russia and Eastern Europe in large. Uh, we have had the revolution, now it's over. Uh, I believe that unfortunately some of the very old struggles between the different countries there and the people there uh, will uh, come up again. Uh, some relatives of ours that live in Tashkent and came here only lately, they have the feeling that uh, Gorbachev is over, Gorbachev revolution is over, and that uh, there will be, uh, as a matter of fact, it's already ongoing, a contra-revolution by the KGB and the military power. So uh, I believe it's too early yet to decide what really will be the outcome of, let's say, the Gorbachev revolution. In the Middle East, unfortunately, this is not going to have any immediate effect because in the Middle East we have a very strong Islamic movement that frightened Gorbachev very much also in his southern republics. So, for us in Israel, we would like very much to participate in that very positive, uh, at least in the beginning of the Soviet revolution, of the anti-Soviet revolution, let's say the democratic revolution, but we have our handicap here in the Middle East, because the Arabs are not going to follow that, uh, that uh, path, and the Islamic people are very much against it. So we are caught in the middle. We would like, as part of the Western civilization, to take part in it, to feel as if we can behave as part of it, but our neighbors and their reaction is exactly the opposite. So I have to tell you that many Israelis feel very, very much uh, with ambivalent feelings about it, because emotionally we are there, 
logically we know that we have to be very careful. So this is a kind of, uh, uh, in that respect, the Jewish immigration brought a huge relief because here is something that we are fighting for, we would like very much, it's a lot of difficulties, but it gives some sense and meaning to your life. So for, for a while you forget what happens in Europe and the Arab world, you deal really with what you have to deal with. And in that respect, this immigration is, as I said before, the real historic change of these years. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accords. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Named by the Foreign Policy Association as one of the top five documentaries of 2011. DVD now available on Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Leon Charney's new book, The Battle of the Talmuds, is now available as an audiobook. This wonderful CD can be ordered directly from the publisher for just $29.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Listen as this audiobook explains how Judaism's greatest scholars broke from their own history and gave spirituality to a people without a homeland. And you can also get the audiobook version of Leon Charney's bestseller, The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get a detailed explanation of one of the oldest and most revered prayers in the Jewish religion as Charney's book explains how the Kaddish evolved. Both audiobooks are available directly from the publisher for $29.95 each, plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call 201-944-7600 and order with your credit card. That's 201-944-7600. Immerse yourself in Jewish history. We're back with Motagura, the very exceptional soldier, I think, and one of the most exceptional in the history of Israel. He was the commander-in-chief of the Israeli Defense Forces, twice wounded, was a paratrooper, head of the paratrooper corps. But more than that, he wrote children's books. In the middle of everything, I once met a general of yours called Micha Paz. And during the Yom Kippur War, you were a military attaché in Washington. I was working in the United States Senate for a man called Senator Hartke of Indiana. Henry Kissinger at that time was playing some games about delivering ammunition to Israel. Things looked very poor. Golda Meir was really on the spot. Micha Paz called me up and said, uh, my boss Motagur said if we could put some pressure through the Senate to get some ammunition going, we might save the country, because in those days it looked very def desperate. And I think the head of the mission was Bundy. That's right. Am I correct? That's right. In the middle of everything, I had never met you, Mota, but uh, Rabin, I think, was uh, ambassador at that time. By that time, he has already finished, and Simcha Din is Simcha also. Simcha Dinitz. And uh, Micha Paz, who was a friend of mine, told me that Motagur is a children's story writer a military tactician, a brilliant military soldier. How do the two jive? First of all, you have to have kids. And uh, I don't, so I guess I can't be a writer of children now. <laughs> so uh, we have four kids. And uh, I started to write the stories, as a matter of fact, as a result of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Because immediately after the Six Days War, I was governor of Gaza Strip extremely busy, uh, above all chasing terrorists. And one evening I came home, I told my wife, Rita, about a certain operation mentioning helicopters and mines. The next morning she calls me and she said, you know what were the first words of the youngest daughter at the time? We had four, she was the third, 14 years, 14 months old. What were the first words? Father, helicopters, mines. 
So this evening we were sitting here in the room and discussing how can we bring up normal children that at the age of 14 months speaks already about helicopters and mines. So I thought the best combination would be if I, when I put them to bed, when I come home, I tell them stories combined on real life and moral lessons and imagination. And I started, instead of reading them stories, telling them stories, in which I put my experience. And as I don't like James Bond as human beings, my James Bond, I decided to make a dog, because kids cannot identify with a dog, while they might be willing to identify with a James Bond, and I don't believe in it. So the dog is the hero. And I put together my experience, as I said, and a lot of imagination and human behavior. And then some of our friends heard this and suggested we publish them, and that's what we did. And as, uh, the fact is that it became immediately a bestseller because it hit right to the target. And if I can quote, uh, once I made a discussion in one of the kibbutzim, in the north with kids because I started to write another series of stories with more imagination and the kids said to me stop it your first stories were very good because you treated us very seriously and we felt that you tell the truth and that we can trust whatever you describe so the message was to the point I mean they realized that in human behavior Jews and Arabs there has to be a way of coexistence without one superiority on the other. Of course, I explained that our cause was very just, but the Arabs are human beings, and they have to be treated that way. So uh, I can tell you right now, uh, that kid is now 25 years old, and she's a very nice lady. So that's how I started to write the stories and went on writing them. Mata, that proves you have an eclectic personality, which means it's very diverse. The thing that I most remember about you, Mata, is that we had breakfast one day in New York, and this was after you had uh, finished your term as chief of staff and you were about to join a labor party, and you said to me, Leon, there's a possibility I might be the prime minister of Israel one day. You still feel that way? Yeah, I believe so. You know, uh, when you serve in the military, they say that every soldier has the marshal stick in his hands. When you get into politics, you have either the president or the prime minister stick in your hand. But no doubt what I have realized since then is that politics is much more complicated <laughs> than military. In military, I knew that if I excelled in the battlefield, and if I'm not dying on the way, I won't be killed, I have a good chance in politics. This is not the issue at all. It depends on so many other elements that uh, you do not control. And uh, like changes of moods and public opinion, national feelings, changes in the world that uh, are opposed to your basic beliefs. For example, I'm a socialist. I was brought up as a socialist. It's a fact that in the last 10, 15 years, Socialism is in crisis all over the world. And uh, right now with the uh, Gorbachev revolution, communism is totally out. Socialism is in big trouble. Uh, in the United States, Reagan, in the United Kingdom, Thatcher. So this is in Israel had a huge effect. So if you put all together these changes that's very difficult to say today to what extent my party will be able to come back uh, to power if you add to that the religious notion that is being strengthened all over the world and in Israel too. And socialist party like my party to a certain extent was anti-religious, which was a big mistake because basically it was never anti-religious. Some people behave that way. And the feeling now in Israel is that more people identify to a certain extent with the need of a certain touch with religion. If I can tell you a story, when we liberated Jerusalem in 67, uh, I got the first to the Temple Mount. 
And for me, that was the top achievement of my life, the Temple Mount and not the Kotel Maravi, not the Wailing Wall. Because there on this hill was a temple. When Eli Wiesel interviewed me, he asked me the first question, what was your religious feeling when you got there to the Temple Mount? And I said to him, listen, I was never religious. For me, the Temple Mount is the combination of practically everything of religion, of tradition, of kingdom, of sovereignty, of freedom. But unfortunately, some people translated socialist approach as anti-religious. This is another difficulty that my party has today. So dealing with politics, it's much more complicated to foresee what might happen. But I, see, I still believe that, first of all, we should come back to power and if this happens, I might try. Well, we certainly hope you do. I think we've had a fascinating conversation with Matagur. If they call the young princes of the uh, Likud party, Meridor and Olmot and Netanyahu, I guess the standard bearer, the youth of uh, the Labour Party would be men like Motagur and Gad Yakobi and uh, Moshe Shachal. I'm not sure Moshe Shachal is such a socialist, though. And. Uh, I think the uh, future of Israel is going to see much more of Matagur in a uh, prominent political position that's editorializing, which we're allowed to do on our show. In any case, Mata, thank you very much, and I hope uh, you go on to your political career. And thank you very much for the breakfast of uh, Beiglach and lax and white cheese. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accords. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Named by the Foreign Policy Association as one of the top five documentaries of 2011. DVD now available on Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Leon Charney's new book, The Battle of the Talmuds, is now available as an audiobook. This wonderful CD can be ordered directly from the publisher for just $29.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Listen as this audiobook explains how Judaism's greatest scholars broke from their own history and gave spirituality to a people without a homeland. And you can also get the audiobook version of Leon Charney's bestseller, The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get a detailed explanation of one of the oldest and most revered prayers in the Jewish religion as Charney's book explains how the Kaddish evolved. Both audiobooks are available directly from the publisher for $29.95 each, plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call 201-944-7600 and order with your credit card. That's 201-944-7600. Immerse yourself in Jewish history. Leon Chani for Leon Chani. We're looking at food in Israel. Food. Good food. Hummus, falafel. Yes, hummus, gumkin. Have 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 falafel. You want to? I try it. Time more. Come on. One, one falafel. No, no, no. Three. Yeah, it's free. We got a bargain, Elliot. <laughs> American television gets a free falafel. Shows the spirit and generosity of Israelis. What's your name? Yoav. Is Yoav. 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 How long do you have this stand here? Uh, four years. And how's business? Now, it's easy. 50-50. How do you feel about the United States? They do a good job? Making a good job. You like us? Oh, very much. 
We are the, the best country in the world like Israel. You want to move there? To visit. It's not to move. Do you want to live in America? You? No, I live in Israel. I love Israel. All Israel. To visit the country. There you have it. This is Leon Chani and Tiberius in front of a falafel stand. And it was gratuitous. The only one who didn't get one was our producer, Elliot Rose, but we'll get him one because he's holding the camera. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accords. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Named by the Foreign Policy Association as one of the top five documentaries of 2011, DVD now available on Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Leon Charney's new book, The Battle of the Talmuds, is now available as an audiobook. This wonderful CD can be ordered directly from the publisher for just $29.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Listen as this audiobook explains how Judaism's greatest scholars broke from their own history and gave spirituality to a people without a homeland. And you can also get the audiobook version of Leon Charney's bestseller, The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get a detailed explanation of one of the oldest and most revered prayers in the Jewish religion as Charney's book explains how the Kaddish evolved. Both audiobooks are available directly from the publisher for $29.95 each, plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call 201-944-7600 and order with your credit card. That's 201-944-7600. Immerse yourself in Jewish history.